This video is a review of the nuclear magnetic resonance chapter in the quantum chemistry and spectroscopy playlist. So we start by looking at nuclear spin, where for certain kinds of nuclei, we have spin angular momentum of the nucleus. So we look at the angular momentum squared operator acting on the either spin up or spin down state of our nucleus, giving us the eigenvalue 3 fourths h bar squared for each of them but the more interesting z component of that angular momentum is going to equal plus or minus one half h bar for its eigenvalue. When our nucleus has that angular momentum of its spin, it can interact with a magnetic field creating a magnetic dipole. So that magnetic dipole is equal to a nuclear factor times the charge of the nucleus over two times its mass, uh, relating that to the angular momentum and the magnetic dipole. This, uh, this quantity here is also called the nuclear magneton, and all of that together is what's called the magnetogyric ratio. So the potential energy that we experience in our nucleus in a magnetic field is the negative dot product, or the inverse alignment of our state with the magnetic field, or of our magnetic dipole. So what we get is a lower energy state and a higher energy state, spin up and spin down. And the energies of those states are going to be plus or minus one half h bar gamma times the z component of our magnetic field. So the change in energy we get when we absorb some photon, which is typically going to be in the radio frequency range, is going to be is going to be h nu equals h bar gamma b z. So using this type of two state system, we can develop a spectrometer where we have some source for photons in the radio regime. And then we have a sample, which is in some type of magnetic field, experiencing magnetic field going through it. And it can absorb those photons and then have a detector on the other side, generating a spectrum for where we are absorbing those photons at a given frequency or at a given magnetic field. So the reason this becomes a spectrum is because our nucleus has electrons around it, and those electrons can generate a magnetic field which opposes the magnetic field that our spectrometer generates. The extent that they do so is called the magnetic shielding constant, which is usually around 10 parts per million, where it affects our original magnetic field, and we can then develop a property called the chemical shift, where the frequency at which we undergo absorption for that particular nucleus relative to the nuclei in a reference molecule, tetramethylsilane, divided by the frequency of the spectrometer times a million, gives us a chemical shift or a distinct fingerprint for that individual nucleus in that individual molecule. So the chemical shift depends on the difference in chemical shielding between this TMS molecule and our given hydrogen nucleus. Typically, the TMS has a greater value than any nucleus, so we get values of a positive chemical shift forming a distinct molecular fingerprint of whatever sample we have. In addition to those individual peaks, we can get what's called spin-spin coupling, where adjacent nuclei are going to couple to one another with their magnetic moments. This is going to cause some of the energy levels to go down and others to go up, resulting in splitting of these peaks to the extent that their coupling constant is going to relate uh, the interaction of those two nuclei. If the peaks are far apart relative to their coupling constant, you get what's called a first order spectrum where we can pretty accurately predict how far apart those peaks are going to be. If the peaks are much closer to one another relative to the coupling constant, you get what's called a second order spectrum where we have to use more advanced methods to find uh, the energies and the frequencies of these peaks. If we have chemically equivalent protons, ones which are in the same chemical environment, the net result is that they don't couple to one another because all the states will end up getting shifted up equally. Whenever we have multiple nuclei next door to one another, we get what's called the n plus 1 rule, where the number of adjacent equi chemically equivalent nuclei plus 1 is the number of peaks that our spectrum, our, our individual peak, is going to split into whether that's a doublet or singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, etc., giving a distinct shape with distinct uh, ratios of those peaks in each case. 
And lastly, we look at second order spectra in the more difficult uh, case where our two peaks are not separated by many times more than their coupling constant, making it much harder to predict what that spectrum is going to look like in those intermediate values. Links to each individual video in the on-screen annotations as well as in the description box below.